on YouTube and Facebook. Correct, Sean? That is correct. Hi, YouTube. Hi, Facebook. We are here with Karen Jankowski, Jim Roberts, Vietnam veteran, Vietnam veteran. Except, so here's what Sam Christie said. All right, I'm gonna, I think she's gonna be with us tonight. Sam mm -hmm. or Jean Christie was a Donut Dolly, one of the 627, I think, who served with the American Red Cross uh, in Vietnam. And she said on Veterans Day, somebody came up to her and said, you're not really a veteran. And that hurt. I'm sure that really hurt. Oh man, we've got quite a few donut dollies. Yeah. And there's Ellen um, again. Ellen Nagy's back. Oh, Ellen, let's let Ellen in and let's let Ellie in. Ellie said she's in the middle of a rainstorm, so this should be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is my daughter Ellie. She's she pulled tough duty. She's at Pearl Harbor. Wow. Oh. Hello, Hi, Ellen. Dan. Can you hear me now? <laughs> hey, Ellie, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm here caught in a rainstorm at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> um, so you, I don't know if you can see off in the distance the faint outline of the Missouri. No, oh. we cannot see it. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> maybe you could see a little bit better. That's the USS Bofin over there. No, can't see that either. <laughs> I see grass and palm trees. <laughs> and I'm jealous. And I am jealous. I don't care if it's raining. <laughs> so, so Ellie, do you have any of the vets with you or are you out by yourself? I don't. You know, I think they all came at different times today and I'm not sure when those times were. Um, and I was planning to go on the USS Missouri tour now, but in this rain, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> we'll have to see. So, what, okay. about, what about a blizzard? Did you get a blizzard? There was supposed to be a, or there was a blizzard, I guess, on the big island, but luckily it did not hit us. So, <laughs> yes, it's great to meet you. You too. The weather forecast here said the chance of very severe flooding in, in Hawaii tonight. Yes. Have you heard that, Ellie? About yeah, severe? I can see that. I can see that. I ran into some of that flooding uh, on the way here. But... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to be able to get home? Are you going to be stuck in Honolulu? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I'm stuck here. It's not the worst thing in the world. I guess I guess not. <laughs> I guess it isn't. Um, and, and so uh, Jerry Fisher is not nowhere near you because I just want to give him some grief just for fun. No? <laughs> no, he's not. He. Okay. I think he came here this morning, but I'm not sure. I'll keep an eye out. <laughs> oh, do we have a great group joining us. We've got a lot of donut dollies. Oh, this is so neat. But I don't see Gwen. Well, we'll just see. Oh, Risa, Risa Eisler. She found Gwen, right? Gwen. She found Gwen. Who then found, who helped to find you, Karen. Yeah. Right. Right. Risa. I think Risa Eisler, according to the. the and um, Jim, while you're there. Yes. Uh, uh, Gwen and I both agreed your addendum, do what you need with your addendum. We respect your, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what you'll do and how you'll do it. So, and I I'll read see, your, I read I'll your chapter. I read your chapter. I liked it a lot. I like your style. Just those little quick chapters. I enjoyed that. <laughs> I'll send you a draft. I'll send you and Gwen a draft of what I'm thinking about. Uh, on the condition that you're willing to mark it up and criticize it and tell me what you really think. No, just approve it because I wrote it. I, I enjoyed your little stories you were telling because it brings back memories when you, you know, the things that you talk about that I forgot about. Karen, how often do you think of Vietnam? Uh, well, I think about it a lot because of my dad being military and because of being there and, and, that's my generation. So I, I think about it a lot. Okay. We are going live. All right. Let's let everybody in. See music. There we go.
goodness, what a wonderful crowd we have tonight, including a great many donut dollies. Welcome, everybody. My name is Todd. I am the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. We are a nonprofit based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that holds veteran storytelling events that are all open to the public. And the idea is to, to create a platform, to have an event, a place where we can come together and people like me who aren't veterans can listen to and learn from and be inspired by veteran stories. And then veterans themselves could have a place where they could share their stories and connect with other veterans and to members of the public. We love it when non-veterans join us. I think we depend on non-veterans like me and like my colleague, Sean Hall. Hello, Sean, how are you? Good evening, how are you? We depend on people like us to ask the stupid questions that veterans would not ask themselves, like when do you salute, how do you salute? Were you scared when you got shot at? You know, stuff like that. And, um, and, and and just to kind of start the conversation, because my, you know, my theory is that uh, those of us who haven't served in the military really, and, and especially if we don't have a connection with a military family, we really don't understand what uh, military service entails. So that's what we're trying to do here with the Veterans Breakfast Club. And despite our name, uh, we don't just do breakfast events, although we do do those also. Uh, we do evening events and afternoon events. So we're very grateful to have you here on this Monday, December 6th, Pearl Harbor Day Eve 2021, the eve of the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And some of you may have been joining us expecting that we were going to do a program about Pearl Harbor. And that's what we were expecting to do, but we've preempted it because something much more fascinating uh, has come along. And that is, of course, that wonderful two-part story that ran in the Washington Post on Veterans Day and then with a follow-up story on November 27th about Jim Roberts, our Vietnam veteran here, who was able to discover the identities of the two women in the photos that he took 50 years ago in 1971 as they visited him in Dong Shui, Vietnam, uh, wearing their light blue dresses that mark them as quote unquote donut dollies. And let me share with you those pictures. Hold on just a second. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna share that. And, and I, I'm so, I, I love it because here's the pictures. Here are the two pictures, okay. We have Gwen on the left and we have Karen on the right. Hello, Karen, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Do we have Gwen with us? I wasn't yeah. sure. We She's do. on. Hi, Gwen. On like the fourth screen she, here. She's. She'll show up when she's on. Okay. If Gwen wants to unmute herself, we would love to have her just say hello. Um, and you know, it's one of those weird things, Gwen and Karen. Uh, I've been showing this picture to crowds of people for years. Ah. Years. <laughs> I mean, I would say, you know, well over a thousand eyeballs have seen this on a screen at our, I mean, no, 2000 eyeballs, because that'd be a thousand people have seen this on a screen at our breakfast, at our in-person breakfast. And, you know, wow. we've just shared it from time to time and said, you know, Jim, and you could see, uh, does anybody want to shout out and tell me what I have wrong on this slide? And I'm just using the slide that I showed at our events. <laughs> what do I have wrong on this slide? Donut. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. See, to you have to misspell donut. You have to misspell donut. <laughs> that would be a real donut dolly. And um, so we've been showing this photo, th these photos for for years. And I have to say, I didn't really know until Jim came along and shared these pictures with me. I didn't know what donut dollies were. I didn't know that they were Red Cross volunteers that they had to be college graduates and unmarried, and I'm assuming not pregnant. I could be wrong about that. Um, and, and that there were you know 600 or so, 627, I think, who served from 1965 to 1971 or 72, um, and that you were part of the Supplemental Recreation Activities Overseas Program. And it, it was a really special role. You, you were there to travel the country and boost morale of uh, troops and uh, provide a little touch of home. And it was a dangerous, daring job. And we wanna hear you, Karen, talk about it and Gwen talk about it and what that visit to Dong Zhuai in 1971 meant to Jim 
And then, of course, we want to open it up to other Donut Dollies or Red Cross volunteers who are with us tonight and other veterans who remember interacting with Donut Dollies. Now, I have to tell you, and I'm, I will shut up in a second here, but yesterday or Saturday morning, we had a breakfast in, in Penn Hills, which is a neighborhood near Pittsburgh here. And we had about 80 or 90 people. And I showed those two pictures and I told the story and I encouraged people to join us. And one of the vets said, oh, I remember the Donut Dollies. They kept them behind a fence and didn't let us go near them. <laughs> <laughs> Fran, that's not true, is it? No, no, I've never heard that before. No. <laughs> Gwen, are you? Gwen, is that you? Good to meet you. Yes, yes, it is. Good to meet you. I figured out the unmuting process. Thank you. <laughs> I am so, you know, and I want. I'm going to say this several times, but I'm so grateful, Gwen and Karen, for you joining us because you don't know me from Adam. You don't know our organization from Adam. We're going back to a, you know, very formative place in your life. And we're going to be asking you questions about it. And I'm just grateful that you're willing to spend the time and devote some attention to our curiosity and our, our, our connection to this very beautiful, wonderful story. Um, so before we, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, when we were in Benoit with the 18th engineers, I just keep using it. I'm sorry, Edith, I can't quite make out what you're saying. Okay. Um, That's better. I've lost your, uh, there, I lost you guys. There you are. Um, when we were in Benoit under the 18th engineers in 1971, February, we were in a, uh, a compound of our own with concertina high wires and all of that stuff in their own bunker. But because we had been fragged once. Mm -hmm. You might yeah. not know what fragging is. That's throw, throwing a grenade at yeah. one of your own guys. <laughs> and, um, and so we, uh, we had a guard and everything. Um, there were misconceptions of why we were there. And there were rumors that, you know, combat pay, which was $65 a month, could get you um, a meeting with a dollar dollar. You know, Edith, it's, you're kind of fading in and out, but I'm getting most of what you're saying, that you're with the 18th Engineers okay. and Benoit. And that oh, um, I don't, I'm not sure where my mic is. I'm not. <laughs> I know, but but I just want to I just want to let you know that yeah, yeah, we can hear you, but I, I'm just I, I I totally get. I mean, I think what you said is just illustrative of um, the hazards of the job that you did. This was not an easy job for several different reasons. It wasn't easy. Number one, it took place in a war zone. Number two, you know. You're, there are very few of you. There, are, I think. I think the number I read was 627, and that's over a period of, of of six or seven years. So there weren't many of you at the time, and I imagine that you grew very close to each other, and your work was very important. and And I, so we do want to get to your stories, but I just before we do, I do want to acknowledge um, Pearl Harbor Day, which is tomorrow, and we originally were going to have a Pearl Harbor Day event. Uh, actually, we were going to be live streaming from Pearl Harbor because we have our media producer, who happens to be my daughter, who um, Ellie D. Pastino, who somehow drew the short stick and ended up getting the trip to Honolulu. And so there she is uh, at Pearl Harbor. Ellie, how are things in Pearl Harbor? Things are great here, except they're a little bit rainy. I don't know if you can see out there, but I'm looking out um, at Pearl Harbor right now. Um, you might be able to see in the distance the USS Arizona Memorial, um, and then maybe a faint outline of the USS Missouri out there. And then we also have over here the submarine, the USS Bofin. Um, and I'm, if it weren't raining, you'd be able to see them much more clearly, but um, it's been really amazing and powerful to be here. And I know that we have a big ceremony coming up tomorrow uh, involving a lot of the World War II veterans that we're traveling with. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's so great. Yes, Ellie is traveling with about a group of about 30 people from Western Pennsylvania, including several World War II veterans 
to Pearl Harbor and many other veterans. And uh, first of all, I don't see any Missouri. I don't see an Arizona. I don't see a Bofin. I see nothing. It looks like you're in Florida to me. I mean, for all I know, you know, you could be down in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So, but, uh, but uh, we, you know, we were hoping that maybe we'd be able to, you know, get on board to the Missouri with you. Um, but if L, if you're going to go to the Missouri, and if you, you know, get a get a chance to uh, break in with some other travelers with you, or some, especially some World War II veterans, uh, please do let us know, and we'll make sure that we get them on the screen. I'm sorry, Edith. Edith, I swear, am I the only one that's having a, it's just, no, I, I, I can't hear unfortunately, either. Edith, I believe your mic is, uh, it might be <laughs> on its last legs. Your, your mic gets very muted and we can't, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, she needs to move closer to her computer screen. Or something like that. Yeah. Okay, I'll work on it. <laughs> okay, you work on it. All right. So for those of you who don't, who don't know, uh, this is the story that really launched the whole thing. Um, uh, we were able to connect Jim to the Washington Post and, and have the Washington Post do an article that would get these photos out there in the hopes that somebody would read the article and I'd be able to identify these women. And it so happens that, so this is the first article, article that came out um, on Veterans Day on November 11th. Uh, two mystery photos here uh, and a 50 year search for the donut dollies of the Vietnam War. They share, shared the two photos and it was so fantastic in real time to watch the comments come in. And one of the comments came from Risa. Risa, I think you're with us. Yes, I'm here. Hey, I'm Risa. Here. Oh, yay, Risa. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, we're watching uh, very excitedly the comments come in. And what struck me first was how many comments were coming in. Second, how wonderful they were for the most part. I mean, you know, comment sections are always terrible, <laughs> you know, because they get it, you know, they sniping and insults back and forth and everything. But here are people, veterans saying like, oh gosh, I remember the dollies, all they meant. So, you know, people kind of really connecting with the story. And then Risa, you come in in the comments and say, I know that woman. Well, I did know the woman. Um, I was very fortunate that my training class, there were four of us that became very close friends when we were trained together in Washington, D.C. Barb Elioff and Gwen Hale were roommates, as was myself and Sharon Wesley. And the four of us in that class in the summer of 1971 became good friends. And so by pure chance, a friend that I've just met recently sent me the article and said, I knew that you were a donut dolly and I thought you might find this interesting. And so as soon as I looked at the article, I knew Gwen right away. <laughs> and then I immediately realized that it was my mission to let the Washington Post know who this girl was. And so I worked and worked, it took me a little while to get into the Washington Post to actually get to speak with Manuel. But when I did, he was just absolutely delighted that I could give him some of the basic information I had about Gwen, which wasn't much. Um, I will say that uh, this has been an experience where I think so many of us have come away humble and full of gratitude. Full, because yes. Jim Roberts, and Jim, it's delightful to see you on the screen tonight too, uh, has taught us all a lesson that even though 50 years has passed, gratitude and appreciation is still important to receive and it is equally as important to give. And I cannot thank you enough for all that you have done. And I know Gwen and Karen are probably just <laughs> awed by this whole experience as are all of us. Absolutely. Oh boy, Risa. You know, the other lesson is you never know the impact you're having on people. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Now I, I would like to speak one quick word. I told you there were four of us that became very good friends in my class, our class. Uh, Sharon Wesley was my roommate. And I can honestly say I have never worked as hard as to establish a friendship as Sharon and I both did because 
we were absolutely 180 degrees different. Uh, I was a farm girl from Nebraska. She was a black girl from Los Angeles. That about says it all. Yeah. And Sharon was uh, uh, probably one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. But she was killed on the last plane out of, of mm. Vietnam when Saigon fell. And so I would like to take this moment to honor her a little bit because she was one mm-hmm. amazing woman. Risa, could, could you repeat I'm her Sharon name, off. please? I knew Sharon also. That was, thank you. What was Sharon's last name? Uh, Sharon Wesley. Just like the, the boy's name, Wesley, W-E-S-L-E-Y. Okay. And she was Sharon, one amazing Sharon woman. Was, Sharon was killed on the baby lift flight. She was oh. on the baby lift flight, the, first, the C-5A flight, the first one that crashed in the rice paddy killed 35 American civilian women, many Vietnamese children, um, as well as military. The last Air Force nurse on the wall, uh, Captain Clinker, was also killed on that flight. Uh, Sharon, Sharon worked for the Red Cross. She also worked for special services. And at the end, she was with uh, the defense attaché's office in 1975 in Saigon, and and that's why she was on that plane escorting those orphans. You know, uh, I Jim, I you might relate to this. I I've, I met Sharon's family at one time, but I have no idea how to contact them now, and I wish very badly that I could give her parents, I have audio tapes where Sharon would write me after I came home and we've just exchanged tapes. And I think how much they would enjoy hearing her voice and hearing some of her stories, but I have no idea how to contact her parents or her, her dad or her brother or anyone. She's That's buried a in, of mine. She's, it says here she's buried in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, did she have family in Muskogee? Not that I knew of. She had a father and a brother in Dallas, Texas, and her mother and her grandmother lived in Los Angeles, as far as I knew. But that was back in 1971. So, Risa, when you, I, 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 she's somebody that I wrote her name down. I'm going to try and find out more information about her. I think I agree. I think it would be wonderful to be able to connect with her family mm-hmm. and have her have the family have those those tapes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Risa, you contacted Manuel and, and Manuel is, was the, uh, is the journalist who wrote the two wonderful stories. I talked with him. He said, I have to say, and he couldn't make it tonight, uh, but he said that it, it may be the most satisfying story he's ever worked on. Mm-hmm. It's definitely been the mo- most comments he's ever gotten in a story, the most phone calls and emails he's ever gotten for us, you know, the mo- most engagement he's ever gotten. And Jim Roberts, why do you think that is? I think it's because of your good looks, personally. (laughs) I'll turn that over to Linda. Linda has a story. (laughs) Well, I just think people appreciate it. A good good story about people caring for each other and, and gratitude and appreciation, especially with this pandemic when we've been all so separated from each other. This was a story that we came together. Why did it mean so much, Jim, for you to discover Gwen and Karen? I don't know. Um, hope I can hold this together. Um, there were there were a lot of glad times in Vietnam, but no happy times. Glad after an attack that one got hit. Glad when you got your orders. Glad when you got on the plane. Glad when you left for R and R. But there were no real happy times. But this was because it was unplanned unexpected just a bright spot in the day it, it really it, it was just so unusual that it just meant so much and you know remind people who may not have heard the story before i mean this was one afternoon or one morning right i mean it wasn't like a long well, time at all we we were in a small village called long and we were in a former special forces camp and there were we worked with the, we worked with the regional forces we didn't work with the army of vietnam we didn't work with the us we were five five men on a mat team and um i'm not sure why we were all there because a lot of times we were out but we got a call on a helicopter on a radio from a helicopter pilot whose radio call sign we could not find in our documentation 
And that was not always a good thing uh, because sometimes they would fly in with interesting things we just volunteered for. Um, and basically said he was coming into land, he needed smoke so he could gauge the wind. So we went out to the helipad and just a short walk away and, and threw the smoke grenade. And uh, can you go back to the picture with Jim Rice in it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the, the, the partial face in the lower left corner was hopped off the helicopter first in his neat press starch fatigues, ours weren't. And we were wondering, we're in trouble. And then all of a sudden, blue gets out, blue gets out, long hair. We realize they're women. And the, it, while it's been referred to as pejorative in the modern comments, our comment was round eyes, which is what we, what we referred to American women. And it is not a, not a denigration, just like some people don't like the word donut dolly, but they're not the women who were there. Right. And so uh, that was it, you know? And so basically my sergeant, who's not in this picture, the gentleman in full uniform is Jim Rice. He's the Matt team captain. I was his assistant. He went out and what they said was that they had they had a problem on the helicopter and they didn't want to risk going back and going down with the women on board. So they they wanted to drop them off at the nearest spot. And we happened to be the nearest spot. They looked on the map, found us, found our call sign, called us, and they left them there while they flew back to Benoit to either get fixed or get another get a, a replacement machine. And they were there several hours. And uh, you can this is this is our dining area. And uh, it was quite the, the Special Forces Green Berets had a way of acquiring things that made things very nice. This, this was a luxury compound compared to where most teams like mine were. But they were there for a few hours and the helicopter called back, said we're coming in, they got on board. Left. And that was it, it was just totally uncalled for, unexpected. And that's why it was just such a happy thing. Like it, a mirage. Yeah, it's like, what just happened here? <laughs> I imagine it, maybe I'm projecting here, uh, Jim, but I imagine it, it's almost as if you realize I, I'm not forsaken. <laughs> I haven't been completely forgotten by the world, you know? It's, it's probably it's similar to that. I mean, you know, I, we weren't feeling sorry for ourselves. I mean, I was very fortunate. I, I, I didn't come back with the usual P, PTSD, although Linda says I did come back different. Um, I, worked with, I, worked with, I worked with four other Americans on my team, four other Americans on the district team, and of those nine men, only two of us were amateurs. I was there as a citizen soldier, Gary Weinrich. By the way, Gary is YB in the book. He sends his regrets. He's just not comfortable on Zoom, but he wants to tell you that, that your visit means the same to, 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 to him as, as it does to me. And, um, and we, we just had a fantastic professional relationship. And so I, and I work very intimately with the Vietnamese. And uh, I, you know I have a very different perspective on the war than they did. So we weren't sitting around saying, oh my goodness, we've been yeah. forgotten. But we right. were just dealing with the idiocy because part of the problem was major pieces of the American army were going home. You know, we'd be inserted Monday by a helicopter unit. And when they called them on Friday to go get us, they were gone, they'd left. Right. And, and so, and so it was just a very, you never knew what to expect from one day to the next. Gwen and Karen, do you remember Dong Zhuai at all? I'll let Gwen go first. Well, I do remember it. I do not remember a lot about it. Uh, but I clearly remember sitting at the table and talking. And I remember what feels like walking down a hall, maybe as we were exiting to walk around the compound, I'm not sure. But I remember being there. And uh, I'm, I'm laughing at myself now because it was such an unusual situation for us to be sitting with just a small group of men and chatting. And, uh, and I, I felt like, oh, gee, I, I couldn't bring them out. They just weren't saying that much. Or uh, I just felt I, I'm a failure. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, oh, gee, I've really laid an egg. What? And, uh, and then to hear from Jim and to discover that they were really they were just a bit stunned. They were in a bit of a state of shock to uh, to have us drop down. <laughs> Karen, do you remember it at all? I, I have to say it, it hurts that I can't say that I do, right. but I wasn't, I had been in country quite a while then, so I had a lot of experiences, but I will tell you that there is only one time in my experience that I was in a helicopter that dropped in the sky. It was drop, and then it would go, and then it would drop. 
And I knew that was not good. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking that that's when we, they put us out because that's the only time that anything ever happened to me in a helicopter that I thought this is not good. <laughs> but I would have been very surprised as Gwen said, because we never stayed with, so, you know, we're able to have a really a nice conversation with just a few people. So that must have been a really nice, nice time for all of us. Well, you know, and it was, yeah. So you dropped because dropped there because of the uh, helicopter. And as you could see, it was a garden spot. I mean, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like Ellie going to Honolulu. I mean, here you go. I can't believe you don't remember it. <laughs> That's, uh, that's downtown dong spot main business <laughs> downtown that's where the yeah that's where the action is and it was a little worse where you were actually but um here is a wonderful then and now uh aerial shot that jim put together a while back here let me uh there we go then and now oh my goodness yeah that is amazing <laughs> The Amazing. intersection is the only thing that remains the same. Can you pause it there, Scott? Uh, Todd? Yep. Go back and pause it, or is yep, that possible? Yep, yep, yep. I can do that. Go on back. Go all the way back. To the, all right. Do you, all right, you see the place marked helipad in, in the picture? Can you point to it, Todd? See yes. Right here. And that's where they settled down. We walked essentially where the yellow line is, turned to the, to, in the picture, turned to the left, and went over to where you see the Mateen bunkers were. That, that was exactly where they sat down. So this is where you landed. This is where you sat. And then you went back to the helipad and took off. Yep. And mm -hmm. that was the last you ever saw of them. Right. Until a few weeks ago. So you, <laughs> didn't, even, you didn't even get to show them the main market area of no. Dong Zhuai. No. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> Look at that. Gwen and Karen, would you have you ever been back to Vietnam? And would you ever want to go back? I have not been back. And... And I've, I've never felt prompted to return. Uh, the reason I went was because of our soldiers and, and now they are back here. And so. That... Let's talk about the reason you went, Gwen, because I'm very curious about this. I, I read in the post articles that both of your fathers, Karen and Gwen, didn't like the idea of you being donut dollies, being sent overseas to Vietnam. And I kind of don't blame them. I'm a father of two daughters. Um, I certainly wouldn't be happy if Ellie said, you know what, I'm going to go to, you know, Afghanistan and, uh, vol you know, volunteer. Uh, that would make me really, really nervous. What did your father say, Gwen, when you told him that this was what you had in mind? Well, actually, I applied twice. And the first time I told him about it and he was very much against it. And so he was very happy when I received the, the very nice, we wish you the best in your future endeavors. And it was just by chance that I was talking to someone in the Red Cross in Atlanta, and uh, I was interested in other opportunities with the Red Cross. And she said, but wait, wait, we have a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know, but mm -hmm. I've already been, I've, I've not I've applied and I was not accepted. And she said, well, let me check. And she came back to the phone a few minutes later. And she said, the only reason that we sent you that letter was because we had filled the quota at that time. But now we have a new quota from Congress. And so I reapplied and obviously was accepted. So the second time when I told my father, I can still picture him exactly what he was doing. And he simply looked down, looked away. And he said, well, if that's what you really want. And from that point forward, he was very supportive. He, he was never negative. You had a not good in father. the slightest. You had a good father. I did. I really did. A wise in so man. many ways. And he was a World War II veteran, correct? Yes, he was. He was in the Army Air Corps. Right. Right. Yeah. I think there's a lot of wisdom in knowing when to back off. You say your piece and then when they make the decision, you bless it, you know, bless it and give yes. it your support. Karen, how about you? Well, my um, when I graduated from college, I wanted to do something 
I still wanted to, to have an adventure because I grew up in the Air Force and I, I was used to having an adventure. I was used to being an independent person and I wanted to continue that. And when I was in uh, Japan, I lived on a base, an air base. It was mainly a housing base then. And when the war in Vietnam escalated, there were so many soldiers that got malaria that they started sending them to the air base where I was living. And so I started volunteering with the Red Cross there. And that was my introduction to the Red Cross. And I enjoyed it a lot. So when I graduated from college, I said, they've got to have something I can do. And so they told me about the program. And I said, I'm coming for the interview. I, this sounds like it's for me because I really wanted to see I wanted to see for myself what was going on with the war because we came from a generation of hippies and, you know, you were for the war, you were against the war, you were getting drafted. I just wanted to kind of see for myself. And I told my father and my mother about it. And my father, my father was in World War II, the Korean War and Vietnam, twice in Vietnam. So he, he really didn't say anything to me, but my father was from Pennsylvania and he was a man of few words. But he didn't say no. He just, I could tell it wasn't his idea that he wanted me to do that. And so when I was leaving, when my mother was driving me to the airport, she said, you know, your father was really upset about this, but he didn't want to be in your way. And so he let you just go on your own because he knows you're going to do what you want anyway. <laughs> so that was my experience. <laughs> Another good father, Jim. Yeah. Just, just an interesting set of coincidences. My father objected to when I told him after I'd already enlisted and he was less than happy. My father was career Air Force also, just like Karen's, and we're all three Air Force brats. And the other thing is Karen and I were at Bloxy, Mississippi and Keesler Air Force Place at the same time in the late 50s, although we weren't in the same area because she's younger than I am. So, so there's just a, a, a whole thread of coincidences that run through this, which are kind of hard to believe. Amazing. It is amazing. And I want to welcome people to ask questions would like to keep the focus on the donut uh, dollies of Vietnam. Uh, I'm just, yes. Who is that? I'm sorry. I didn't see. Todd. Yes. It's Bill Motais, uh, the exec, and I'd like to speak. Sure. Very special donut dolly by the name of Jenny Kirsch, who died in Vietnam in August of 1970. I was the chapter exec in Warren, Ohio, who got the call on Saturday night, and the one who had to tell her parents about her untimely death. I want to tell all Donut Dollies the rest of the story at this moment to honor them. Jenny, President Nixon, and Melvin Laird got involved in this situation and sent the old guard to honor Jenny Kirsch and Red Cross Donut Nollies at her funeral, the only time in American history that a civilian has been honored by a full military funeral and they sent the old guard from DC, those who guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. Jumping forward to all mm -hmm. Donut Dollies, about three years ago, the Vietnam vets in Trumbull County, a little town called Brookfield and Warren, Ohio, and the state senator, the state of Ohio, had a celebration for Jenny Kirsch and named a state highway in her name. Wow. In a beautiful ceremony that honored all of you donut dollies. And if there's any listening, there were many that showed up from around the country. There were many Vietnam vets that showed up from all over the United States in a little town of 1,200 people. Thank you for seeing it. I have lived with this story for 45 or 50 years. Jenny is now honored with a state <laughs> highway in her name, rightfully deserved. As a result, it's been a long time in coming but to all you donut dollies, I fell in love with all of you while I met you in the tragedy. But thank you for being so very special. And from the Jenny Kirsch family and from myself, God bless you all. Can I say something? Please. Oh, was, was that in 1970 with Jenny? 
Yes. Yes, that was August of 1970. I see um, you're nodding your head. There she is on notice that she is. And I think that's a guy by the name of General Cassidy's daughter, who is the other uh, donut dolly. But Ginny is on the left. I have that picture. I had this picture painted with an, a large sound by a local artist with a quote from Ginny, who had written home her last letter regarding the shootings at Kent State and how terrible they were and if we could only live in peace. It now hangs in a museum in Brookfield, Ohio. I think if Ellen, Ellen is on, yes. Ellen, did, did you know her? Jenny? I did not know her. I came in in uh, July. I knew Judy Cassidy though. Uh, she was in my training class and we were, we were friends. Um, but that happened shortly after we ca I came in in uh, J July 6th of 1970, and that happened in August. And she had only been in country a few days. Or and days or so. we had to move. Do you right. remember? We had, we had to move. We, we, were on, we got assigned to that same base. There, they've got That's the Jenny. picture. Wonderful. That's it. The, the Virginia Jenny Kirsch Memorial Highway. Yeah, well, I did know about I did know about that. And Ellen and Ellen and I were together and we had to move from our compound because of that situation. They moved us from there into a more secure compound. 24 core compound. 24 yeah. core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 24 core, the gentleman, the soldier that was in charge of moving us and getting us there did not like us. No. And I worked hard to get him to like us. And I finally got him on our side, but he didn't like it because they threw the guys out of the barracks and put us in. And he, he it took me a lot of work to get him to like us. Could, could we do something to, uh, uh, on my screen, I see there are five different screens of pictures of participants in this Zoom conference. Could we have a show of hands somehow? How many donut dollies are on here tonight? Great question, Reese. You know, Risa, I should just turn the program over to you because you are you are very you know exactly. Yeah, let's do this. I do. I'm curious too. You could either put up your virtual hand or your real hand. I would love to see. We have if you don't know how to put up your virtual hand, put your screen, your mouse over the screen. Go to reactions. Go click on reactions, and you'll see Ray's hand down below, down at the bottom of your screen. Say that again. Oh, okay. If you move your mouse over the Zoom windows, you'll see all of the options pop up at the bottom. You'll see one that says reactions with a smiley oh, face okay. and a plus. Click that and then click raise hand. We want to do that because we want to get as many. And when you raise your hand, you go to the front. You go to the front page. And we want to get as many of those raised hands as possible okay, to get thanks. you on the front page. Lori Pearl, you don't know how to raise your hand? I, I look in there my own self, so... <laughs> Is somebody counting? 22, 23. I can't find me now. 111. Holy cow. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Okay, there I am. 24. iPad Painter 2 has her hand up. I, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find it. You go down to the bottom. Go to reactions. Yeah, I got a thumb up. Hand 20, Susan, Please. you are 25. Gwen. Come on, Gwen. Get with the program. Raise that hand. <laughs> oh, I, I thought I was already. <laughs> I, I thought I was already counted. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, please ask. Um, I was in Korea. I was a donut dolly in Korea. I was wondering if all the rest of you are Vietnamese donut dollies, or was anyone else in Korea? We're I not in Korea. Korea. Pardon? I was in Korea. Nancy, Nancy Kelsey's. I don't know you. Nancy. This is Audrey Devonport. I was in Korea. Hmm. I was there in uh, 59, 60, 61. Uh, I was a little bit later, 64, 65. I would I'm like the oldest all, person here. <laughs> I would like us all to remember all of the donut dollies who were in Korea as well. There's a lot of emphasis on uh, Vietnam donut dollies, but they're I don't know the exact number, but there was a, just a lot in Korea. And several who were in Korea ended up also going to Vietnam. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. I met this fellow here sitting by my side 
in <laughs> in Korea. We came home and got married. Seven months later, he went back to Vietnam for a year or so. Uh -huh. And they wouldn't let me go. I wanted to go back, but since we were married, they wouldn't let me go. Karen Looks like we're up to Gwen. 31. I have Karen and Gwen, I have a different. question for you. What unit were you at when you visited a gym? We were we were out of Long Man. Sec, was it Second Field Force? It was called Plantation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had been in um, Second Field Force in 1970, and before that, Coochie, and I left Coochie a yeah. week before Ginny arrived at Coochie. Mm. I, I would love to ask why. Hmm. I mean, okay, L let me be a little controversial here because, boy, I got roundly booed when I brought this up last time. And sometimes, you, you know, you like getting booed. Um, what do you say to somebody who says, you know, the term donut dolly, it seems a little demeaning. <laughs> no. No? Uh, you had to have been there. <laughs> you had to have been there. Yeah. It has been always used fondly by the guys. Yes. So, yes. Yes. And, uh, and even to this day, I went to Europe after Vietnam. I, I taught school for a couple of years, then I went to Europe, and we were all back there. And the guys were the same guys that were in Vietnam, and they still remember us fondly. They still oh, absolutely, but you know, it's like the diminutive, you know, donut dollies, like you know, or it, I think for a brief time, maybe in Vietnam, you were there was a an attempt to call you Kool-Aid cuties or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, we, we did have, <laughs> have other nicknames, but Donut Dolly came from World War II from right. the Red Cross yeah. women that served donuts and coffee. So it's an honorable, uh, it has an honorable history. That's it. I think you're, God, yes. yes. This is Judy Higby, if I could speak. First of all, if you would raise your hand so that you stay in the upper corner, Otherwise, when somebody speaks, you're flashing off and on. Can you do that? You raise your own hand so you stay up in the upper corner. It, you virtually raise your hand, you'll stay. Yeah, and, and you should know no, that. I mean, so, oh, you're me? Asking, you want me yeah. to raise my hand? Yeah. Oh, like that. talking to me. I thought you were talking to them. Okay. You, no, you, no, no, Todd. Now, how do I raise my hand? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe you have the reactions? <laughs> There we go. There you okay. go. There we no, go. You All right. Flash without All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the second question I have is, well, no, it's more like a comment. It's Excuse me. Excuse me. May I just tag on something to the first question? Yes. Well, I like, I'm sure all of us have met people. And when the subject of donut dollies came up that they would often say, you've got to be kidding me. What do what is that all about? But every time I explained the, the background of it, and, and whenever I would explain, the title Recreation Aid just did not hold up. <laughs> and then I have no idea who came up with the term Donut Dolly, but it was, and the Red Cross, as I understood it, did not care for that at all. Not but at it all. became it became bigger than the Red Cross. They couldn't stop it. Exactly. But once I explained uh, the history of it, so to speak, everyone, every single person would just nod and say, that makes sense. That makes sense. I like that. If I can just comment, um, Ed Fender here somewhere, I'm on page two or something. Um, I just, I wanted to say that today, you, you couldn't get away with something like that just because of the, uh, the social setting. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, was, it was good then. It was. Also, you, you could not get away with the qualifications. Oh. Uh, between the ages of 21 and 24, a college degree, single, female, you couldn't do that today. You couldn't right. require that. No. That's Susan exactly has it. her her uh, physical hand raised, but hey, also Susan. I, I do over here. Yeah, we see you, yes. Susan. I would like to say, I continue to get having a 
36 year career with the military in special services, recreation services, all of it. And when I was in, um, when Desert Storm came about, they hauled me into a conference room and said, what are we gonna do? And I said, you're doing nothing because we got women in the military. The landscape is different. Right. And they all agreed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we aren't gonna dust us off and put us out there when we have women in the military, lots of right. them. Exactly. Yeah. Can't you're, happen. Susan, you're so right. You are all pioneers. Yeah. You're pioneers. And well, I think that's got what, those women to start coming into the military. Yeah. People who, I mean, you know, my daughter who's 25 years old, she has to be reminded about kind of what life was like in the mid 1960s for women and the restrictions and the professions that you, well, you know, weren't, uh, weren't open to you. And, it was, a, it was a different world. And so I imagine, and this again, could be my projecting that if you were an adventurous woman, a, you know, with uh, willing to take risk, um, this was something that was uh, attractive to you. Lori Pearl, she's a friend of mine. She did go back to Vietnam in 2020 on our Veterans Breakfast Club trip. Lori was a, uh, a, a donut dolly. I'm going to get a great picture of her up. Lori, why in the world would you volunteer to go to Vietnam in what, 1970? Well, uh, well I think very, very similarly to, uh, to what one of the other uh, women said, uh, you know, we kind of grew up, I was in high school and then college through the 1960s and I graduated from college in 1970. And we had really grown up with the Vietnam War in our living rooms because it was on the news every, every single night and in the magazines and, you know, and the photographs. And um, the, I wanted to see for myself, you know, what it, what it was really like. Um, and it, it was a very intuitive kind of a choice on my part uh, to go because I, I had never heard of this program before. Um, I've never had any kind of affiliation with the Red Cross and when I found out about it, it was like immediately, immediately, I, I knew that I was just going to go and I was mm -hmm. going to do this. Um, and I did. Did and you buy I these? really felt very compelled to do it. Did you buy these stylish sunglasses in the U.S. or did you get them in Vietnam? Oh, no, I took those with me. I had those. <laughs> <laughs> they are so great. Look at you. You are out there. Yeah, we were, we were, all of us were, were very much out there um, every day. What did your mother have to say? Um, my, my mother was, was, uh, I, when I um, was invited in for the, for the job interview with the Red Cross, I told my mother about this and I told her that, um, you know, I was, you know, very, very interested in this job. Um, but didn't tell her a whole lot else. And she wasn't one to really ask a lot of questions. Um, so I came back from the interview and she asked me how it went. And mm -hmm. I told her that I thought it went very well. And that I really thought I had a good chance of getting this job. And see, I hadn't told her where the job was. <laughs> um, and so she wanted to know if I got this job, where was I gonna go? And I told her and uh, and actually, I said, you know, well, I, if I get the job, I would have a choice between going to Korea and going to Vietnam. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to go. And, and well, what she initially said was, <laughs> they call that a choice. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but yeah, it, it was my choice. And, and she actually was, was very, very supportive of it in, in her quiet way. She didn't express any kind of... Uh, you know, she didn't try to talk me out of it. She didn't, you know, she didn't try to, to, uh, you know, prevent me from going in any way. So she, she and, and my dad both were really very supportive about it. And like I said, uh, Lori Pearl came on our trip, our two week trip to Vietnam in February, 2020, we squeaked it in right before the pandemic hit. <clears throat> and one of the places we stopped was, was Quezon. And, and Lori, you had been to Quezon and you took this picture up on the, up on top here. Uh -huh. and the same view today we were when we were there in 2020 you took this picture yeah 
Mm -hmm. Same place looks very different, doesn't it? Same place. And I must say that I, even when I was, when I was in Vietnam, I was there August of 1970 to 71. Uh, I would said, even while I was still there, I'd like to come back in, in about 10 years and see what it's like then. So it took me a lot, it took me a bit longer. I didn't get, make it back there until 50 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had wanted to go for many, many years. And I have to say, it just was one of the most gratifying things I have ever done to go back. And it is, it is fascinating for somebody like me who is you know so curious and interested in veterans and their stories to be with people who served in Vietnam as they're going back. It was just terrific. Um, Todd, could I say could I say a quick hello? Yeah, because uh, I see Sarah Smith. Sarah and I went in country together. Mm. Hi, Lori. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> Good to see you. See, I don't see her picture, but I see her name, Carol Grell. Oh she was goodness. in our group, also. Oh, is that great? Yes. Um, and um, to go back to an earlier topic from from this evening. Uh, Jenny Kirsch was a member of our group, so we all we went to Vietnam together. Although, oh boy, yeah, so we knew Jenny. Oh boy, uh, George George Sluk, I know, is a special connection also to that story. George, do you want to talk a little bit about Jenny and you know what you what you know about her story? Well, yeah, th um, thanks, Todd. Um, I think the donut always here. Um, ha have uh, uh, really come together and addressed uh, her memory. Um, as we know, she was only in country a day. Uh, and as we haven't said, but we, we need to say, she was murdered uh, by a U.S. soldier uh, in Kuchi. Yes. And it was so suddenly that uh, her friend, um, Susan, who went to Ankei, uh, hadn't even had a chance to send her a postcard. So I wrote the story uh, that's out on, on warstories.com uh, about um, uh, Ginny's uh, uh, fateful uh, uh, memory. And uh, this is a real tribute, getting all your donuts together uh, to remember her. Pretty special. So thank you. Thank you very much, George. You know, Tom, I to, yes. can I say something too? Um, speaking of getting together, uh, we do appreciate it, and we have an email group and other groups of donut dollies, which we can tell you about at any time. But I'm also very curious to know how many of the veterans who are on here um, saw donut dollies when they were in Vietnam. <laughs> Nancy, I'm getting to it. Absolutely, oh. we want to hear. <laughs> okay. Oh, we definitely want to hear from them. Renee, you have your hand up. Yes, I wanted to go back to, you were talking about us being pioneers. Back in the 80s, when they were having congressional hearings on women going into combat, and of course there was a lot of, oh no, no, they can't possibly go. Um, during one of the hearings, some of the donut dollies attended were sitting up in the balcony and I was not there. So this is you know secondhand information. But whoever was speaking was talking about the women would be fitted with flak jackets, you know, helmets, the whole bit. Uh, the conversation went on and she turned around and pointed to the women in the balcony. And I believe one of the men been wearing uniforms that they went into combat wearing nothing but those light blue uniforms. We can surely go in wearing full gear. <laughs> so, yeah, we were pioneers of a sort because there sure weren't a lot of women in a combat zone without gear. There are a, there are a few announcements I want to make. It would take a, a, a bit of a break um, just because I, I wrote a few things down here. Um, first of all, Gwen, Terry Harmon, yes. Terry Harmon sent me an email saying I can't make it. She has another commitment, but she wanted to say hi. She served in Da Nang with you, Terry oh. Harmon. She served oh, with I remember Terry. She were, she, Terry served with Ellen and myself. Yes. Yes. Oh, did, I, did I get that wrong? Yeah, okay. and, Sarah, and Sarah as well, I believe. Sarah, yeah. Sarah. Did you not, Sarah? Sarah. Sarah. Yes. Didn't, didn't, <laughs> wasn't uh, Terry with us? Yes. She was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Judy Harper was there. Yes. Yeah. And Sarah was always a bad girl. Uh -oh. oh, we want to hear about that. 
We definitely <laughs> want to hear about that. That's what we're waiting for. Um, the other, the other, one other thing I want to say is I want to encourage people, if you want to, let us know, give us your email so that we can send you our schedule and you can join us anytime. We do this VBC happy hour uh, every Monday night at 7 p.m., you know, always a different subject, always a different group of people, but it's always an open conversation. And we, we love having people that you can see, you could go to our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org. You could check out our schedule of upcoming events on Thursday night, for example. Uh, we're having uh, a KGB by Jack Barsky on, on Thursday night at, at 7 p.m. He's, if you've ever watched the FX show, The Americans, he was one of the you know, one of those embedded spies who who lived the life of, a, of an American, but was a KGB spy. And he wrote a fascinating memoir. And we're going to have him on on Thursday night. Um, so please do join us anytime you can. If you if you send me an email, I'll make sure that uh, you get our our schedule <coughs> updates. Would love to have you uh, anytime. The other person I'd like <coughs> to briefly is just Steve, Cicero. Steve, are you with us? Steve Cicero. Yeah, I'm here, Todd. Hey, Steve, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Uh, this is Steve Cicero is a, a man after my own heart because he's a retired history <laughs> teacher. And, um, and he now is the director of the Institute for Learning in Retirement, the ILR. And Steve, I'm, you know, I'm guessing that some people here in the crowd today are old enough to be retired. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm guessing that too. Just, that just may be, yeah, that may be true. <laughs> and just because you're retired doesn't mean you stop learning. I mean, in fact, I think, you know, I, I just see um, with people, uh, you know, people who are older than, say, 60, 65, who are really involved in learning. And that's what the Institute for Learning and Retirement offers, correct? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Um, hey, before we talk about the ILR, I just do want to make uh, two quick comments. First of all, um, like you, I am not a veteran, so I want to get that out of the way. Uh, but also, you know, after listening to the program this evening, um, I'm sitting here thinking about my three grown daughters and how the world has changed because of people like the Donut Dollies who are being, you know, uh, honored tonight by this program. And I can't say enough, you know, thanks for changing the world that my girls have grown up in. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. That's, that's exactly how I feel, Steve. And I know that with ILR, the Institute for Learning and Retirement, you're looking for obviously people who want to take classes, but also right. for people who want to teach classes, either remotely or in person, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, you know, when you and I talked about possibly having a little partnership uh, with the VBC, that certainly is something that I had in mind. Uh, the way to think about the ILR is it's kind of like a, a college for adults and very much is structured that way. Semesters, there's a fee, but it's not nearly what tuition is at the uh, college. And we also do have a connection with the uh, Slippery Rock University. We use one of their classrooms off campus. Uh, so there's some connections there, very similar. But yeah, definitely we are looking for instructors. We're obviously looking for members too. Anytime you sign up for a semester with the ILR for a very brief, a very small fee, 70 bucks, you can take 12 classes or trips. We also do trips with our group. And um, the instructors is what, uh, you know, you know, Todd, we, we talked about this. There's, I think, some great opportunities for some of the folks out there in this audience right now who have stories they want to tell. And we have people almost every term who are veterans or who represent veterans organizations. And uh, we have Dennis McMahon, who is a tomb guard. He's done a talk on that. We had uh, uh, John Cyprian, uh, Cyprian uh, from the VA talk about VA benefits. And even if you're just interested in a topic and you wanna do a presentation on something, uh, we're always interested in having new instructors. And we do Zoom and in-person classes both. And so if you're concerned at all about in-person classes, we do follow the Slipper Rock oh. University protocols. So I think that's kind of the overview. There is one other thing I just wanted to mention on the desk here, by the way. tomorrow. It came in. Uh, I was just having a conversation. 
I'm sorry. Somebody having trouble hearing me? No, no, we hear you. Yeah, I think okay. somebody's unmuted and talking. Okay, no problem. Um, I was just having a conversation a couple of days ago with one of our recent instructors who's an archaeologist. And this isn't a program he's going to be able to do. Next semester, but I'm looking forward to hearing it. He's actually working with a team that is currently exploring the USS Nevada, which I'm sure is going to ring a bell with a few people in our audience here. It's one of the battleships that was at Pearl Harbor, the only one to get underway. And uh, they had trouble finding the wreck of the Nevada when they finally the Navy finally sank it. Uh, and this is one of the guys who was involved in finding the Nevada, and he's actually virtually had an opportunity to see it, kind of like that Titanic with Robert Ballard. Right. And so I, I can't wait to hear that program about the Nevada, but he'll, that'll be a future one. But those are the kind of people that we have that give presentations for us. And we have a website and we have a Facebook page. So we'd love to see some of those faces that I see out there tonight join us at the ILR, either as instructors or as members in the future. And once again, that's the ILR. And I yeah. put your contact information here in the chat on the Zoom side, Steve, and maybe Sean could transfer to our Facebook side also. So people who are watching there or on YouTube uh, can contact you if they're interested. Steve, I invite you to put your contact information in the chat here on the Zoom side. Again, we'll, we'll transfer that. If anybody wants to become an instructor, for ILR or anybody who wants to take a class at ILR, you know, check it out. There's always, there's a, a, a great uh, catalog that you have online on your website. Eating. Thank you very much, Steve, for coming out and pitching. I hope you'll pitch it again, uh, more of our events. We'd be happy to. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity and uh, thank you so much for this program tonight. It's been uh, really fascinating. Oh, totally fascinating. Totally love it. So, Look, join the Veterans Breakfast Club if you want. Veteransbreakfastclub.org. Follow us, all that stuff. Um, Lisa Wilkins, I was going to... Okay, hold on a second. Lisa, I'm getting to you. Henry Shepke, can you just say hi and before you have to go? Henry is 13. He may be 14 by now in Madison, yeah, Wisconsin. 14. You're 14? Um, yeah, just turned 14. You just happy birthday, Henry. Uh, Henry joins so many of our programs. He loves listening to these stories. Henry, had you ever heard of Donut Dollies before? Um, the first time I heard of them was the program that you guys did a while ago um, with some Donut Dollies on it. But before then, I hadn't heard of them. I think, do you have any uh, autographs? Henry collects autographs of veterans. Do you have any Donut Dolly autographs? Yeah, I have a few. It's, I have, I've got a few Donut Dolly autographs. Okay. I think you should get Gwen's and Karen's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. And Thank you. Before you leave, he has to go to basketball practice. But before you leave, Henry, could you put maybe your, your email here in the chat so that they could email you to, to send uh, an autograph or you could you know contact them? Uh, why don't you put your email in the chat? Please. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat before you leave. And we also have Connor Ritchie, who is 16 in Lafayette, Louisiana. How you doing, Connor? Had you ever heard of Donut Dollies? I've heard of him from the pilot program a long, long time ago. Yeah, last year we did a program with Donut Dollies. And uh, Todd, I yeah. have a few announcements I would like to tell you. Let's keep them brief. Yes, thank you, Connor. Yeah, so my great-grandfather was also Army Air Force, World War II. He's dead now. Uh, his youngest brother just had a, just had his 91st birthday a couple of days ago. And unfortunately, he's the only one left. Uh, in a few days, I will be interviewing a veteran who is very, very interesting. It's His service spans in three different wars. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and of course, the Cold War. Uh, he's, he's a retired four-star admiral. His name is Tom Hayward. And um, he was a fighter pilot in the Korean War. He flown with Neil Armstrong during the Korean War. And he was a Vietnam captain. He was a commander of the USS America. And then he was promoted to Rear Admiral of the 7th Fleet. And then he became CNO, which is Chief of Naval Operations. Yeah, he's big 90, deal. He, he is 97 years old and he lives in Washington. 
and he was part of a uh, President Reagan administration that in that in CNO. That's where we met General Barrow, General Jack Vesey, General Jones, and all the VIP generals and admirals. Well, listen, Connor. After you talk to him, you uh, come back and report back to what he told you. And that, I mean, what a fascinating conversation you're going to have with him. Yes, yes. I, I never met a, a, a veteran that's ranked that high. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you're gonna have to call him, sir. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure, Connor. Um, yeah. Thank you, Connor. Thank you very much. Hey, I also want to, and this is connected to our Donut Dolly's theme here. We have Lisa Wilkin on. She's from Indiana, and she chairs the National Women Veterans Committee of AMVETS, and is just very much an active uh, veterans advocate uh, generally. Lisa, are you still with us here, Lisa Wilkin? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us. What do you think about this conversation with, uh, you know, these wonderful women who served 50 years ago in Vietnam, Korea, and elsewhere uh, before, you know, women could serve in combat zones in the military? Um, I think they are phenomenal and role models and should be celebrated and recognized. Um, I wish we could do more to recognize their service. And um, this program this evening has been very enlightening. And then I've been Googling and reading um, because a lot of people don't know anything about what you ladies did or why you did it. And it's important for history to know why you know, serving was important to you and why you were willing to do it. And so I appreciate you, you know, having this program this evening and for all the ladies who are on here, um, keep telling your stories. Um, please do that. We need to make sure that everyone recognizes that women have always proudly served even if we had to be a pretend to be a man to do it or outside of the DOD, we have always been willing to serve. And I appreciate you so much. You know, this program, I feel like we're kind of marking progress uh, that we've made in the past 50 years. Uh, but I know that, you know, women serving in the military, like you have served in the air force, still face a lot of problems. And I know that you address a lot of those in the work that you do as a veterans advocate. Uh, what kind of issues especially does your work focus on? Um, specifically, I try to bring um, recognition to the service of women veterans. Unfortunately, all too often our service is invisible and we are mistaken as the spouse or the child of the veteran, rather than just recognizing that women proudly serve. Um, also, I specifically advocate about military sexual trauma. Right. And right now, the Military Justice Improvement Act is being included in the National Defense Authorization Act, which has been um, something that advocates have been working on for years, um, but it is in jeopardy right now. And so um, my main focus is to get women veterans to tell their stories because until we get more stories about women who serve in fiction and nonfiction, our service will continue to be invisible. Thank you, Lisa. And I know that we plan to do a program with you and talk about this subject more, both on our Scuttlebutt podcast and here on uh, VBC Happy Hour. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, I want to go to Fred. Is it? And Fred, I, I, I have you written down as somebody I wanted to talk to. Fred, I believe you pronounced your last name. Okay, I'm going to try and get this right. Abate Marco. Perfect. Like a member of the family, you said. There that. we go. Uh, Fred Abate Marco, what a fascinating person you are. I received an email. I think you were on one of those email chains about this article. I haven't met you, but I did look you up. You have a wonderful website uh, that is your uh, that contains a lot of your wonderful writing about your Vietnam service and about other things, veterans in general. Um, you are going to be doing a major article on the Donut Dollies, correct? 
Uh, yeah, I uh, I'm, I was commissioned by Vietnam Magazine to to do an article uh, um, about the donut dollars because, as has been said by so many people on this on this event tonight, um, these are 627 women who from Vietnam who are just not known enough, and uh, even the folks at Vietnam Magazine didn't have I was didn't have much familiarity with the the story of the donut dollars, so. Um, I've written about them uh, a number of times in the past. Um, I, I may have been the first journalist to misspell donut dollies, and Nancy Smoyer <laughs> pointed that out immediately uh, when my article appeared in the Associated Press in 1980. Um, hold, hold it. Do you mean that you spelled it correctly? Is that what you're saying? Incorrectly. I said, yes, I spoke, spelled donut the way you, you're supposed to. Yeah, but you. Not, in other words, you spelled it the way you're supposed to. Thank you, Fred. You just you just defended me. I appreciate that. That's, yeah, <laughs> Nancy, not, Nancy Nancy Smoyer will get you. She will get you. <laughs> I'd like to raise a, a comment to Nancy Smoyer. Is my Sarah right? Nancy, yes. are you wearing a donut dolly uniform? Uniform. He is. I oh, am. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wow! Unbelievable! Whoa, whoa! Hey, Stand up. Um, we got a spotlight. Um, Start talking, Nancy, and then Sean, could you spotlight it, Nancy? It's better from, from here up. You don't need to see the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I am so impressed. Oh, oh that is the going. coolest thing. So tell okay, wow. uh, can you point what tell us what's going on with this thing? You've got patches on the side? We, on the we, we wore the patch of the unit we were with. And so my first unit was the CAV, first CAV, the second unit was the uh, or the third unit was 25th Infantry Division. And I was also with the Marines, but they don't wear patches. They proudly do not wear patches. <laughs> and so we didn't wear um that. And then of course our name tags and ARC and the Precious cross, red cross. Why? Why did you join, Nancy? Why would you? Why would you join and go? Um, I well, I've been curious about what war was like for a long time, but uh, ever since I was a teenager. But I um, basically wanted to go because I, as the war was uh, getting going, I kept hearing negative things about it, our being there all over the world as I I traveled around the world, and I wanted to go there to do what I could to make it better for the men that were there to do did what I feel, could. Did you feel you did it? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it wasn't always easy and it wasn't always um, like they understood our being there, but it was, it was the best thing I've done. Most worthwhile thing I've done. Oh my, how great. And I think a lot of the women, as we've talked about it, a lot of the women would agree with that. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Look at this. This is Gwen's dog tag. So you were issued dog tags. Yes, we were. We were treated almost like military, but not quite. Almost, but not quite. And here's a wonderful yes. picture, I think, with Karen. I think this is Karen in the center. Yes. Look at that. And oh. Ellen and Sarah. Yep. yep. It's Sarah. I'm in that Sarah picture, Harmon. too, up in upper left-hand corner. All right, this one, this goofball up here. Yes, that's me. Yes. That's oh, me. Risa. <laughs> and the girl to clear over to the right, standing up, is Joyce Rice. And I think that's at Cameron Air Force? No. no. That's at Long Denang. Denang. Denang, okay. Denang. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am behind uh, Karen. Yes. And, and that's Terry Harmon over to the right of Karen in the back. Okay. Oh, Who's wow. sitting to the left of you, Karen? Maria. Uh, Maria. Oh, to the right. The left is Sherry Rankin. Oh, yeah, Sherry. S sorry, Sherry. Yeah. I want to, I do want to hear from some of our Vietnam vets uh, who served in the military. Do you remember Donut Dollies? I'm surprised they let you around Marines personally. <laughs> the, I, you had to feel so sorry for the Marines because they had nothing. When you went there, they had nothing. Everybody else had a little something. They had nothing. Yeah. I always felt sorry for them, but they seemed to like it. Bill Moran, I'm sure they liked you. Bill Moran, did you remember any donut dollies? Bill, uh, let's unmute. <laughs> 
Yeah, I never really had the opportunity. Uh, it, it would probably, I think a lot of guys would say, well, you'd had to be lucky because when you're out in the forward areas and you're only in out of the, out of the jungles and stuff, at a certain time, you have to be lucky to be in for your three days when they might be, might right. be there. Um, but I'll tell you, this was a real feel good show tonight. I really enjoyed this. I mean, I, I, I mean, I tune in as often as I can. Sometimes you feel bad. Sometimes you want to cry, but this is just an amazing night. I, I really, really recommend this to a lot of, a lot of guys out there should watch the show. And I should let people know, yeah, this is being, this is streaming on YouTube and on our Facebook page and it'll live, it'll be archived on our YouTube channel. So uh, we're going to be, you know, sending it out and making sure that other people could watch it kind of in, in reruns as it were. Ed Blank, did you ever see any donut dollies when you were in Vietnam? Am I am muted? Yeah, we hear you. Todd, I've thought about this often. I don't think I saw an American woman in that whole year. <laughs> That's no reflection. It's just a matter of chance. I was usually in the middle of nowhere with a platoon putting up telephone poles and stream cable. Right. Uh, it was definitely not a social situation. And... And although I saw a lot of Vietnamese women, inevitably, I truly, I, I don't think I saw anything approximating a, a, doll, a donut dolly in that year. Well, Ed, Ed um, may, maybe you were lucky because the, the fact is donut dollies could be hazardous to your health. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I want to tell you, I want to tell you my experience. Uh, now, I was a remf. I wasn't in the forward area. And my first encounter with Donut Dollies is I had to interview one for the base newspaper when she showed up as a newfer. Um, and of course, the first question I asked her is like, why are you here? I mean, you don't have to be here. We got drafted. And I got, you know, one, you know, one to the world. Well, as it turns out, we became kind of good buddies and we, we were drinking buddies. There was this very unauthorized bar on the base, this the American division in July. Uh, called the hog farm and it was kind of really like an after hours club and I worked nights so I had a jeep at my disposal and I would take this young woman home to her trailer which was up by the general's trail it was air conditioned they had telephones at tv and one night I drove her up there just to drop her off and the phone rings in her trailer and she picks up the phone and I said oh this can't be good and before I could stop her she said oh yeah he's here the oh, next yeah. day, I was on a plane to Quan Tree for Operation Lamps on 719. That was the last I saw of the donut dolly. So, Ed, count your blessings, baby. Fred, was that Michelle? That was Michelle, yeah. That was Michelle. You could, okay. I am going to uh, give you the link to that story about Michelle right here in the chat. And are you, have you ever been in touch with her again? Not directly, but uh, <laughs> I've got my spies out there. Okay, so she probably has, wants nothing to do with you, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> but can, I, can I say something to Fred? Yes. Fred, we were in Quantry. Yeah. So, so you should have seen us maybe at some point there. We had an outpost there. Yeah, well, once, once they sent me to Quantry, Karen, I, I got nowhere near anything except green and red dust. <laughs> It was green uniforms and red dust. <laughs> but I listen, I, I, I do want to say thank you to all of you for everything that you did, because as much as I was mystified by your presence, I was thrilled by it. Um, and uh, uh, I've had the good fortune to be associated with as friends and, uh, and, and whatever with a number of, of, of women uh, who served in the many years since 1970 and 71 when I was there. And, and, and I'm, uh, I'm a better person for it. So thank you. Oh, how great. Thank you. Fred, and Fred is one of the first people to write about the Donut Dollies here in this 1980 article in the Los Angeles Times. You were an Associated Press journalist. Donut Dollies, they also served. This is where I got the figure 606, uh, 627, Fred. And look at how he misspells Donut Dollies. <laughs> right there. 
that. Look at that. Look at that. Um, wonderful stuff. Just wonderful stuff. Um, Aunt, yes. This is Ahava Martin. Um, hey, I'm, Ahava. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I just want to let the donor dogs know. I know that they that program went away, but there are many of us and. I'm one that had a career with Red Cross and Red Cross are still deploying. We have um, men and women deploying to all over the world. And, and we have people in Iraq now and, you know, in Kuwait and um, they do, um, they're a little restricted on some of their um, recreational activities because of COVID, but that's, Yep, that's me. <laughs> My way yeah. to Bosnia. But I just want you to know, and some people don't know that, you know, some of us were able to make a career out of being with the Red Cross and, and being able to deploy and do things too. So some of the legacy of what you did has continued over the years. So I yes. just remind people that what they did did not stop, it's continued through the years. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, Bob Mizwa, I saw that you were going to say something. I bet you never saw any donut dollies up where you were near the DMZ. I saw donut dollies one time, and I, I put up on the chat board, you know, did any of you donut dollies, uh, were you ever in Quang Tree? And uh, Sarah Smith said that she was up there. I remember one time I went down just to get a haircut, hit the PX, and I come walking out. There's a group of donut dollies, you know. Uh, they were like uh, surrounded by the guys, you know, the bees around the honey hive, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm standing there looking. It was like total culture shock, you know, because I was going back out in the boonies with my tank platoon, you know. Uh, but uh, and what Karen said was she was up in Quang yeah. Tree, too. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you girls ever remember being at the where the PX was located, the barber shop and that it, on base and, and being around a bunch of guys? I remember With being donut. around a bunch of guys. What's that? <laughs> I remember being around a bunch of guys. You mean, you mean the guys were around you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't get in close enough. <laughs> oh. Larry Gambrit. Larry Gambrit, did you ever did you ever see donut dollies where you were? No, I, I wound up being in the glass and in the mountain. And the only people, women I have actually seen were the Vietnamese women. Okay. I even thought they were remarkable for the things that they had to do. Yeah. You know, for, for the husbands and stuff. Right. And, and and that was really great. And uh, I would like to thank the Donut Dollies for all their hard spent effort and work. And I'm glad most of them made it back home. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Larry, you're. It was so good to see you on Saturday, John Crawl. You were in the 25th Division at Coochie. Did you ever see any Donut Dollies? Yes, Todd. As a matter of fact, I did. It was just uh, one time. Uh, Coochie Base Camp was north of Saigon, and uh, further up was uh, our other base camp at Tain Ninh. And oh, it was in the summer of '67 that uh, the Donut Dollies came out to our position and uh, sort of spent a couple hours with us. I, I remember they brought some board games. <laughs> um, some stationery and pens for us to write home <laughs> and, and the warm Kool-Aid. <laughs> I remember the warm Kool-Aid. Sounds <laughs> they, delicious. It was delicious. It was. <laughs> uh, I think there were about four girls and they had like two uh, escorts on the UE with them. And of Probably. course, uh, two door gunners. Uh, when, the, when their UE sat down, they had two more circling our position the whole time, just as a safety backup. But uh, I do remember it was uh, one treat. It was a good day. One good day over there. <laughs> That's just what Jim Roberts said. Just what Jim Roberts said. Exactly. Yeah, Dan, I, Va I'm sorry, Dan Vaughn, you were up near the DMZ with the Marines. I'm guessing you didn't see Donut Dollies. You could unmute yourself. Dan likes to hide. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want his name to be shown. He doesn't want his face to be seen. He doesn't want to be heard. But if you jab him, if you poke him a little bit, make fun of Marines a little bit, there we get, you get to rouse yeah, so him. That's all you got to do is make fun of the Marines just a little bit. <laughs> How you doing, Dan? It's good to see you. <laughs> No, as a matter of fact, I did not see any donut dollies. Um, they weren't up in the jungles, so as far as I was concerned. 
they were they were just a little bit uh, south. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, our, in in our defense, um, we the Marines didn't think that uh, women belonged in a combat zone, and uh, we did our best to come see you. But you were always, as you say, you were out in the jungle, and we we came forward, but not as forward as you guys. Right. Yes, ma'am. That's that's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. I want to say that's wrong, though. That is wrong. <laughs> You're not right. Because my granddaughter was here today and I had my uh, bucket hat from Vietnam to give her because she saw this story and that I have a picture and I gave it to her today. I'm in that bucket hat on the DMZ on Christmas Day. So we were there. Yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, thank you for being there. <laughs> Speaking of Christmas Day. Uh, we're getting teased a lot about serving that lemonade, which I can taste to this day and sticky. Was that stuff sticky? But did any of you on Christmas Day serve something different to the troops? Yeah. Good question. We, I remember I was at Cameron Army and the commanding general there had us donut dollies fly in a plane all day on Christmas Day and give all the sh soldiers a shot of Jim Bean. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh, Risa. Did Saigon know about that? I don't think they ever did. <laughs> but the soldiers were pretty happy that day to see us. <laughs> I can imagine. Dan Vaughn. Uh, yes, there was a uh, uh, previous um, comment made, and I can't remember who made it, about the airplane that crashed with the donut dolly in the, in the swamps. Yeah. What caused the crash? I, I do not know. The only thing I was told, it was some kind of engine failure or something like that. I, I don't think it was enemy, enemy action or anything no, else like that. It was it was no, it, it, I, um, I'm Ann Kelsey. I was not a donut dolly, but I was a librarian with special services. Um, uh, the, the C5A baby lift crash, what I've talked to the pilot many times, um, and it was uh, the the cargo door blew out. There were they, they had so many people loaded on that plane. They there were people on the regular seats on the upper level, but they had babies and and women and military stuffed into the cargo hold. And there was a mechanic. <laughs> there was a mechanical problem. And the cargo door blew out right after takeoff. And the pilot was able to get back and he tried to get back to the, to the, uh, to Tonsonut, but it crashed in a rice paddy. And so it was a mechanical, but that's what, that's what happened. And most of the fatalities were the, the, people that were in the, the lower cargo hold. Those were most of the people who were down there were the ones who died because that was the immediate impact. And when the door blew off. Ben Wright, who is with was, us here, Ben Wright was a C-130 pilot at, at, for, at that same time, flying those same missions out of Tonsonut. Ben, I know that you know a lot about that crash. Yeah, it, it actually was a maintenance error. They had cannibalized uh, one of the latches off the after and door when it was down for another maintenance thing, and they put it back together wrong. And it was actually a uh, hydraulic line blue uh, from that latch, and it uh, it messed up the elevator, which controls the pitch of the aircraft. Uh, so when the air crew tried to turn around and go back to Tonsonut, the only thing that controlled uh, the pitch attitude, or in other words, the angle of the aircraft, the horizon was with power. Because uh, you push power up and the nose will come up, you pull the power off and it goes down. And the pilot really did an excellent job and almost got it back to the runway. Um, of course, he was going, they were at pretty high airspeed when they impacted uh, the ground. Uh, and doing that, when we were airlifting refugees up later that month, uh, we were flying over what was uh, left of the hulk of the of the fuselage. Of course, was was still sitting out there, and it was crews out of my squadron that went over and took body bags to bring all the all the people to the morgue and Clark um, out of that particular aircraft. Thank you for that info, 
Ben. Sure. Um, I just want to just show that picture of Anne again because she did speak. Look at Anne. How old were you there? 13 years uh, old? They let you go to Vietnam? 23. 23. I was oh. one of the old ones. Uh, and she was a special services librarian. I think this is another picture of you, correct? That's the day I left. That's the day you left. Oh, boy. Um, and from what I remember you telling me, uh, the, your libraries, Air Force personnel could use them. Navy personnel could use them. I'm, I'm sorry, hey. Army personnel could use them. Navy had their own libraries. The Marines could not use any library, and they did not have their own libraries. Why is that? Well, that's not entirely. Any, any military could use the Army libraries. But in point of fact, until the very end, there were no li there, there were no libraries uh, north of Chulai until after the Marines left. Okay. Um, that was military politics. But okay. uh, the Air Force had a library system. The Navy, the Navy did not. Uh, because the Navy library system was taken over by the Army in 1966. Okay. okay. Hey, uh, Ed, Fender, I see you're waving your hand. Ed, did you drop off? I believe had to Ed did. Ed, Ed had to leave. Okay, Ed had to leave. All right, so maybe he was Could I just say, say something to Risa? Risa, look in the chat. I've sent you a couple of direct messages. I, I think I found Sharon Wesley's brother and oh. I've, uh, and I, and I, I put an address that I found. He is on Facebook. Oh, I, I found would him be, through one. Yes, that's what I, I saw. I don't know how to use the chat. I looked on there and I see that Fred has sent me a message and somebody else did too. And I don't know how to respond. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let Todd try to get my email. You can certainly email me. I'd be glad to talk to anyone and if i could get those tapes to sharon's brother that would be wonderful Risa, okay, yeah. please do, oh, okay i'm going to invite all of you donut dollies especially anybody who doesn't get have my email please email me just send me a note todd todd at veteransbreakfastclub.org Risa, i would love to be in touch with you about further programs um, I'd love to hear more of your story. I'd love to hear more of all of your stories. We have a magazine that we publish quarterly, VBC Magazine. I'd love to get some of your stories in there. Uh, so please do email me, Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. And uh, I see that we've come to the about the end of our program here. I wanted to, Mary Klepper, how are you? I know Mary is a tour guide, a historian. She leads tours. Um, I, you've you've put a, been very active in the chat here. You had a lot of questions, and I've been thinking about you, uh, Mary. Um, oh. And I'll tell you why. I'll show you why. Oh, my boyfriend gonna... passed away. Yeah, that's why. That's why my boyfriend. Yeah, I loved. I let me let me let me share that here. Got there we go. It. That's it. Oh, yep. Yeah. Mm. He. Well, he would he wouldn't really ever know my name his his aides that were always there with him did but he knew who I was because I always wore this crazy American flag bucket hat and so he would always you know give me a good kiss when I would see him and I joked that we were probably married one day and he he always, he was so witty so funny um I, so many great stories I could tell you about him he just I mean just crazy things too but he he was great he was just great he was great and I always felt that he was a little too uh, honest to be president. Yeah. Uh, he had a very sharp, <laughs> sharp, sharp sense. There's, there's of humor. my bucket hat. <laughs> yeah, there's your bucket hat, and there, there he is. Uh, he, there he is. Without him, uh, without him, we wouldn't have that World War II memorial. He was instrumental in, in getting that done, and and that's one of the reasons he would sit there and greet his uh, fellow veterans. And wonderful. Yeah, and regardless how you felt about him as a senator or vice presidential candidate Absolutely. or presidential candidate. Uh, what he endured is really remarkable. Look, yeah. this is what he looked like before he was wounded. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, he was a physical specimen, very athletic, Univers University of Kansas, joins the army, becomes an officer, 10th Army Division in Italy, 
gets wounded within weeks of the end of the war, badly wounded. And I think he never quite knew what hit him. Literally, he didn't know whether it was a machine gun or whether it was shrapnel, mortar, what, what it was. But it hit him in such a way that it paralyzed him from the neck down for a, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, he eventually was able to wiggle his toes. He eventually was able to get some movement in, in his arms. But he was in a hospital for 39 months. <laughs> 39 months, full body cast, thought that he would never move again. And this guy battled back and uh, not only did so, but had a, a rich, fulfilling, successful life as a leader. And um, he's just always been an inspiration for that reason to me. And I think we'll just miss him having him on the national scene. So I yeah. thought we would uh, pay tribute to Bob Dole. Uh, in Thanks. His past. Uh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'd like to say one more thing. Nancy invited everybody to join our chat group. Uh, the Donut Dollies, I'm sorry, it's limited to Donut Dollies. But we also monthly have our own Zoom call. And if any of the Donut Dollies can get to Aunt, to um, either Ann Kelsey or Nancy Smoyer, I think both of their email addresses were posted up. We'd love to have them join us on our Zoom calls, which the next one is tomorrow night at five Eastern time. Yeah, you guys need to get together and talk more. Definitely, Karen, yes, when? You have a lot to talk yes. about now. Yes, yes. Absolutely, and if, if there's anything I could do, Renee, to help get the word out or help connect you to each other, let me know because you guys are just wonderful and I'm so grateful. Doris, you have your hand up? Hi, uh, yeah, I'd like to put in the plug for Arcoa. We've met with you in Pittsburgh. Yep. Uh, two plus years ago. That's for anybody who's volunteered or worked for Red Cross anywhere overseas. We missed, uh, was it Larry Fender? We'll have to chase him down. Um, but it's also open to people who are friends of Red Cross, can be associate members. So those of you who support the programs. That's me. ARCOA.org. Should I I'll put it in the chat room? Yes, I will join as an associate and member. And we do conventions once a year. Who knows what we'll go back to post-pandemic. So Washington, D.C. in July. And, you know, uh, Jim Roberts. Yes, Doris, I just wanted to thank Doris. Doris was the first person I contacted when they had their meeting in Pittsburgh, and you arranged for them to talk at the Heinz History Center. And she was responsible for showing the first time we, we publicly showed the pictures of, of Karen and Gwen at that meeting. And I just want to thank her for that. And I want to thank Renee, Renee Johnson for, for, for pushing the name on, on their Facebook page. So Doris, thank you very much. You're welcome. And we've actually, we're hoping to get the reporter to come talk to us in Washington a little bit about the process. We'll see. You know, I think you should have another reunion in Pittsburgh. That's personally how I feel about it. Um, <laughs> so I'll pitch it, but... Hey, we're about eight minutes over time, and I've pledged that we're not going to go over as much as we usually do. This is so it is almost irresistible. I really have to, uh, you know, prevent myself from from uh, just going on for another hour with you guys. I, I just love these stories. But before we leave, I do want to share one thing with you. This is Harry Van Riper. He's a friend of mine. You can see he lost his arm in Vietnam in 1968. Um, he's a real inspiration. I was hoping that he would join us tonight uh, because he also is in search of a donut dolly and I'm going to show you her picture. Yeah, no, that's a, hold on. I think you're, there we go. Do you see this? Do you see this woman? Can you read, can you read the message? To yeah. Van Riper, best of luck. B Flyth, F L Y T H E. I wonder if she is hospital. Yes, I bet she yes. is. Oh. That's what I'm wondering too. Okay. In 1968, though, that's we can still look. Watson Army she Hospital. Said, she was not a donut dolly. She was service to military hospitals. Okay. Before we looked her up. Okay. Okay. But that doesn't mean she wasn't just as. I mean, it just was a different program. Yes. With a different cross. She's just as important. I and, you can, and there's Harry in the lower left. He's just lost his arm and he's smiling. 
And he said, he's always wanted to thank her because it just, oh. it just gave him a sense that his life wasn't over, that he still had a lot of life to live. And he has lived a beautiful, wonderful, <laughs> inspiring life. He um, and, try. Yeah. In fact, he's going to get a prosthetic for the first time ever in 50 years where he'll be able to move his hands. And uh, I mean, we want to have him on to talk about that sometime, but listen, thank you all for joining us, Karen, Gwen, especially. And um, may I move it a little further into overtime? Okay. Okay. I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thank kidding, you. Gwen. Yeah. No, I'm glad you're doing it. I, I have just thought of almost nothing else since the since Manuel with the post began this process of connecting us. And it's just been so overwhelming. And I've just thought so often of what an amazing day that was, Jim and Karen. It, to me, it was a God day because I never had another incident like that, a problem with a helicopter that I was in. It was just amazing to me that that pilot located you all and sat down. And I did not know until I spoke to you in that Zoom call through the post that, that the pilot was, was aware that he may not have been able to get us back to post. He was concerned that we would go down with him. And so that's why he left us with you, which is just amazing. And to have that time to sit and chat with you for those three or four hours. And, but now to be reconnected after 50 years, that was post college, my first real job. And now I'm retired and we're reconnecting. And it just warms my heart. It, I am just so grateful to you for reaching out and letting us know, uh, just reaching out. It just means so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Gwen, thank you so much. You guys are my heroes. and I really do mean that. You're an inspiration. I just feel privileged to be able to spend this time with you. Please stay in touch. All right? Yes. Yes, All indeed. Right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.